Today, in a pair of 6-3 rulings, the Supreme Court's conservative supermajority struck down President Biden's student loan forgiveness plan, and they ruled in favor of a Colorado web designer who wants the legal right to refuse service to gay patrons. Now, I'm not a lawyer, <laughs> but even a layman can tell that both these rulings were legally dubious in a way I'll explain in a moment. There's something fundamentally broken here that's on display I think is worth taking some time to get into. The archetypal example of judging, right, the one that we all think of when we think of judging, goes back to biblical history, all the way back to the judgment of Solomon. He's a king, but also a judge. That's part of what kings did back then. And the king, as judge, is tasked with solving a dispute between two women, each of whom claims custody over a child. It's the one where Solomon suggests cutting the baby in half. Now, by saying that, he reveals who the real mother is. But more importantly, in revealing who the real mother is, finding a fact, he resolves the dispute. Oh, you're the real mother. You get the child. That, resolving disputes, is fundamentally what judges do. They resolve conflict nonviolently when it arises. That's what we have them for. Two sides claim to be harmed and a judge tries to find a resolution. And this is true when it comes to the Supreme Court. The highest court in our country only deals with the tangible, not the hypothetical. Its own website says so. I quote from it. The court does not give advisory opinions. Rather, its function is limited only to deciding specific cases. In order to get before the Supreme Court, and it is very difficult, the vast majority of cases don't get there, you need to have some sort of dispute between parties with an actual injury that needs to be resolved. Take, for example, Brown versus the Board of Education, okay? Iconic case. Oliver Brown wanted to send his black daughter to the school that was closest to their home. The Topeka, Kansas Board of Education insisted that she be bused to a segregated school farther away. That was the dispute. The injury was the injury to the family and the daughter. What makes today's two cases so galling is that there were no disputes. The court was not actually solving any problem between two parties. Instead, the conservative majority was functioning like a legislative body, pushing their preferred right-wing policy outcomes, irrespective of the actual facts at hand. So let's start with the first one. There's first is the case of 303 Creative. Lori Smith owns a company called 303 Creative in Littleton. She wants to make wedding websites, but not for same-sex couples. She and her attorneys claim that Colorado's anti-discrimination law violates her free speech rights. Now her case has gone to the U.S. Supreme Court. She hasn't actually developed a website and refused to serve uh, LGBT people, but she said, if she does weddings, which is where she's going to, she's going to she doesn't want to have to do that for same sex couples. OK, this case is frankly ridiculous. A woman who might want to start making wedding websites one day, but doesn't and wasn't when she filed the suit, wants the right to refuse service to a hypothetical gay couple that wants her to design their website on religious grounds. Should they ever ask her to make them one? No one has asked her to make one. It's almost as if this case was designed for the express purpose of moving this issue up through the courts so the Supreme Court could rule on it. Almost like, uh, what would be the word, advisory opinion. Now, to be fair, Lori Smith did eventually cite one example of a potential client, a guy named Stuart, requesting a wedding website for him and someone named Mike. Her lawyers say that request came one day after she filed her initial lawsuit back in 2016. Though, interesting wrinkle here, a reporter of the New Republic called up Stewart and, well, he's married to a woman. Quote, I wouldn't want anybody to make me a wedding website. I'm married. I have a child. I'm not really sure where that came from, but somebody's using false information in a Supreme Court filing document. Now, I guess it's certainly possible Smith did receive such requests seven years ago. There's some mix up of the name. But that still doesn't explain how she has been harmed. What is the harm? What harm has she suffered? According to her own petition to the court, she just, quote, plans to expand her business to design wedding websites in the future. You know what? I plan to dunk someday. We'll see what happens. And yet today, the Supreme Court ruled in Lori Smith's favor on this conjured hypothetical set of facts with no actual dispute. 
Because the conservative majority doesn't care about the actual facts and they don't care about actually judging. They want to undermine Colorado's anti-discrimination law, making it easier for religious conservatives to discriminate against gay people. That's the policy outcome they wanted from the beginning. It's why the case got to them. That's one of today's rulings. But then there's another one. There's also the student loan case where, once again, wait for it, no one has been injured. President Biden wanted to relieve up to $10,000 in federal student loan debt for some borrowers, $20,000 for others. Now, the holder of the debt is the federal government, right? The people whose debts are canceled, well, they're not injured. They're beneficiaries, right? So who's injured here? Well, you can argue that the taxpayer, us as U.S. taxpayers, we're injured. We're on the hook for it. But here's the thing. You cannot just sue the government because you're a taxpayer who doesn't like how it's spending its money. It's a bedrock principle of standing. Because otherwise, literally every single cent the government spends would spawn an avalanche of lawsuits. Totally unworkable. Black letter law, you can't do it, okay? A couple of individuals came up with this tortured and somewhat preposterous reason why they were injured, and that was one of the suits today. And unanimously, it was kicked on standing grounds. These people don't have standing. They don't have an injury. But there was another case. And opponents of debt relief landed on this agency called Mohella, and it handles student loans in Missouri. Now here's the crazy thing, there's the logo, Mohella. Mohella, the people that were putatively injured by this did not want any part of this. As the American Prospect reports, quote, internal documents from the company reinforced it did not file, did not solicit, indeed had nothing to do with the case at all. In fact, one analysis found that Mohella would stand to make more money if the debt relief plan goes through, otherwise known as the opposite of an injury. And don't just listen to me on this. Here's oral arguments. Justice Amy Coney Barrett actually asked the solicitor from Missouri arguing to end the debt relief, what's up with Mohella? Where, where are they? Why aren't they here? Do you want to address why Mohella is not here? Mohella is not here because the state's asserting its interests. Mohila doesn't need to be here because the state has the authority to speak for them. And that brings me to... Why didn't the state just make Mohila come then? If Mohila is an arm of the state, why didn't you just strong arm Mohila and say you've got to pursue this suit? Your Honor, that's a question of state politics. Whoa, 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 That's a question of state politics? They're not here because why? Because they're not injured. Because there is no injury. Because there's no actual dispute. You just, state of Missouri run by Republicans, don't like the policy and want to use the Trump supermajority Supreme Court to get rid of it. And, and it worked. Justice Barrett, who asked that question, good question, ruled in that guy's favor anyway. The conservatives on the Supreme Court do not like Biden's student loan forgiveness policy. It doesn't matter if there was no injury, no one withstanding, and there's no real dispute. When you have judges that turn away from the work of resolving disputes and following precedent, they're just not doing anything that's recognizably judging anymore. Those are what binds a judge and judging. And the problem is not just that I think the substance of these decisions both are bad, although I very much do. It's that this court has adopted a kind of imperial mindset that all decisions about public policy are actually theirs to make. Six right-wing politicians in robes on the Trump Supreme Court are granting themselves the authority to govern as a kind of unaccountable super legislature. At this point, you're well within your rights to start asking, well, who elected these people? If they're not bound by precedent, if they're not bound by disputes and standing and all the trappings of judging, and they just say, like, I don't like this law, I don't like that policy, who elected them? What's more, you would be forgiven for thinking the whole thing is corrupt and illegitimate and wondering how long exactly this can continue without some seismic reform. 